Great. Hi, Paul. Thanks for making time to talk to me today. It's great to see you. Um, I wonder if you could just begin by saying uh, a bit about yourself and maybe a bit about the AFA network as well. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Chief Exec of AFA, um, the Association for Professional Healthcare Analysts. The initiative we started about 10 or 12 years ago now, um, really out of a sense of frustration that there's no natural forum for analysts to get together to discuss common issues, to have a moan about, um, moan about the, the, the lack of um, engaging work that they're involved with, to moan about all sorts of things. And, um, and it kind of grew and, and grew from there. And so we started primarily in the Southwest, as I said, about 10 years ago. We now have a national footprint across the UK, we have branches in Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales. Um, and yeah, it's, um, it, it really came out from something which I wanted to promote the work that the analytical community were doing. And I th from experience, they were doing great stuff, but it was it wasn't seeing the light of day, and, um, and managers were not engaging in a, a in a meaningful way with the community uh, and making the best of them. And that resulted in people then just getting frustrated and bored, and you know, and we were losing good talent back into the private sector because they they weren't being pushed or challenged to do anything more exciting than create a pie chart from two numbers on a on a fairly meaningless dashboard you know that's a, that's an extreme example but that's the sort of things which were going on um, and also um, we had no core competencies and standards and skill sets to against which to assess folk i'd inherited a business intelligence team and i had no idea what they were capable of and whether they had skills and competencies to meet the needs that I was being asked to provide. So, so that's that's where AFA came from, and um, yeah. So, and everything you've said resonates very strongly uh, with me and with, uh, with with what we're attempting to do with with this piece of work as well. Um, I want to start incredibly broad, um, and I'd just like you to tell me a little bit about the sort of sources of value you see in analysis. So why is good analysis important? In what ways does it help decision making within health and social care? So for me, data and analytics have always been the lifeblood of an organization. And I don't I don't really understand how you can make robust decisions um, in a vacuum of analytics. And because what are you basing it on other than than gut feeling? Um, and that will work, that will get you through up to a point uh, and I'm not saying it doesn't and there are areas where the data missing the analytics are not sufficient to support uh, to support that but I also think that a lot of certainly around as we've seen the development and requirement for quality improvement service improvement initiatives over the years a lot of them have come good ideas but the analytical assessment element of it is not stitched in at the beginning. Mm. And when we get to the end of initiative X or initiative Y, um, and we're never quite sure whether or not it's worked or not, because we've never got to the point where we could analyze it properly to do that. So, so I think we've, we've implemented bad service improvement initiatives, which haven't actually delivered any change at all. I think we've thrown away some uh, service, initiative, service improvement initiatives which were probably good um, but we didn't really know about it um, and what we have with all of that stuff then is the decision making process is tends to be clinically whoever shouts the loudest so the squeakiest wheel gets the most oil and that's how we've got to decision making and that can't be the right way of doing it for, for, for me I just don't think it's appropriate and we will get people asking questions and generally the first approach is not let's check the scientific evidence to see if that question's already been answered and I'll give you an example of that in my working experience somebody wanted to know whether or not damp housing 
led to respiratory problems. Well, there is a wealth of evidence about that sort of thing. But because that evidence was not pertinent to that particular locality, it was dismissed. And so we then have a whole ridiculous situation where we're replicating work which has already been done. And that, again, is just a waste of resources. <laughs> they didn't mean particular to that house, did they? No, no, not quite, but it's, it's not far <laughs> beyond estate. Yeah. So there's, in a sense, what you're describing is, is almost a lack of um, a lack of using the sort of scientific method as a broad framework for decision making. And then within that, um, the use of data and evidence to, to help drive decision making. You're describing, I think, a much more small p political world. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. Just to expand on that for me a little bit then, um, I, you, you, you've sort of started to to make the assessments I'm about to ask you to make. How well used do you think analytics uh, and analysis currently is within the health and social care world? I think uh, uh, my assessment of it would be in some places good, in some places bad and in some places probably non-existent. Um, I think it's it's a real mixed bag across the piece. There are certain s sections of the system um, who are well versed in doing that. Um, so the Department of Health, for example, um, because of the way in which they've interacted with the government statistical service and the government OR service, they are much more used to doing that sort of let's commission a piece of analytical work to support policy development X, Y, Z. So they're, they're quite used to that way of thinking and working. Um, District General Hospital, you know, um, in uh, in the boondock somewhere, probably less so um, and less well supported in terms of analytical capability and capacity. Um, so they will, you know, they will generally have uh, an analytical team who are doing central returns, who are feeding the beast, who are doing a lot of that sort of stuff, and who are churning out things which are fairly routine but are not doing what I would call anything which we would recognise as modelling or analytical investigation. Um, and also I think sometimes what we find with a lot of this stuff as well is an objective analytical piece can be quite challenging as it it challenges your own world view um, in a more objective way. So if it doesn't support your world view of how a service works you're more inclined to dismiss it as a as a as an exec. So, um, and because we don't have um, a recognised analytical profession, it's quite easy to do it. So, um, again, one of my frustrations was, you know, I have, I have a degree in statistics, I've published in the BMJ, European Journal of Cancer, conducted phase three oncology studies for, for many years, etc, etc, etc. But I have to justify myself to junior doctor X who's done a module in statistics at med school. You know, it just we're in that space still. Um, interestingly, as a statistician, I don't have to do that justification. As an analyst, it's a whole different world. So that's absolutely fascinating. And of course, I'm really interested in your views on the workforce, because uh, I know that's been a, an animating passion of yours and the, it lies behind the network in exactly the way you're describing. So so say, so say a bit, uh, I think you've called them the Lost Tribe. You said, yeah. say, say a bit about how well, how badly you think we make use of the analyst workforce at the moment. Um, that badly would be my view. I, I think there's a lack of there's a lack of investment in in them as a as a general community. There's a lack of investment in talent spotting. There's a lack of investment in development. There's a lack of investment in uh, bringing bringing them through into leadership roles. There's a lack of investment in recognising that they may have a place uh, on um, on on trust boards, for example. Um, and I think generally. Um, they're they're an easy group to ignore. Um, I think uh, a lot of a lot of analysts are not very good at particularly kind of pushing themselves to the fore in terms of saying I can help with this problem or I can help with that problem. Um, so there's and they tend to be buried away in the end of a 
car park in the porter cabin, bashing out, you know, good things and getting frustrated. So they they're kind of quite easy to ignore. But but the potential of that workforce is enormous in terms of being able to support, as we were talking about earlier on, better decision making and better service improvement initiatives um, uh, and all of the all of the other things that um, you know, certainly COVID has amplified the need for in terms of doing that and supporting people with more robust decisions. So I think, um, yes, definitely they, they are the lost tribe. But in some ways, because we have no professional, it's, it's not like being an accountant, for example. I always use finances as, as the kind of, as the touchstone for this. So, you know, if you're an accountant, you need to have, you know, got qualification from whomever or you have a degree in in finance or accountancy or economics or whatever it is, is your entry point and it's the same for statistics it's the same for health economics it's the same for operational research it's not the same for a, a, an analytical community a lot of people have fallen into analytics almost because they didn't run screaming from the room and somebody says can you open excel you know and we get that sort of they fall into it rather than making a, an actual choice of saying this is a career I want to pursue. So again, I would say nobody ever went to their careers advisor when they were leaving school and says, I want to be an NHS information analyst. How do I achieve that? So we don't have that. And we've, we've been trying hard to get to that point. I think the other thing is um, being designated as admin and clerical as a collective is a problem in terms of establishing that credibility with the clinical world. So, you know, I, I would much rather, and again, we've been lobbying hard to do this, uh, see us redesignated as technical and scientific, which is definitely the space I think we inhabit. That's the role that we do. It much better describes our, our functions. Um, but actually to get that change, which would cost zero pounds to do, actually done is inordinately difficult. and. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't we shouldn't try to do it. And um, the other thing is around the whole professionalism agenda. If we want to be treated as professionals and recognised as professionals, then we should step up to the plate and behave like professionals and understand that we need to demonstrate our own capabilities in the same way as we would expect of a, an accountant or a health economist or a statistician or a nurse or a physio. So I think it's incumbent on us as a collective to actually demand it for ourselves as well. That's first thing you I, I want to I mean in in a sense we've described the potential value for analytics and then I, I'm afraid I've dragged you into some of the sources of woe about our current use of it and you know poor use of and poor development of the current workforce. So I want to I want to ask you the revolutionary question, you know, what is to be done? What, what are we going to do about this? Where would you start? What would you do? I'm conscious though in asking that and you, you start to touch you touched on it briefly in your last answer that we're also we're also talking at the time of the response to COVID and there have been certain ways that the analytical community have got hold of that and have done things with it and, and behaved in different ways and shared more things and networked and, and all of those kinds of things. So when, so when I'm asking you now what is to be done, I guess there are things that we're currently doing as a, or the analytical community is currently doing that you'd want to retain or accelerate or do more of or, or whatever it might be. Anyway, long way of asking you, but what would you do? What what do you see as the agenda? I think there's a couple of things. I think um, I, I would hope there's a broader agenda and understanding of the requirement for openness and transparency around availability of data and sharing across not just across departments and organizations but I mean if you if you look at this at an STP level and if you broaden that out into expanding out into the social care world I mean if anything has been highlighted I mean in terms of a lack of lack of data understanding around COVID I mean the social care side of things kind of stands out like a sore thumb uh, in terms of that so there has to be a better collective understanding of, of the need for sharing and the need for not only sharing data but for sharing expertise across those boundaries as well. Um, I think the other thing for me which is which COVID has kind of highlighted um, the gap is there's a gap of 
system level level leadership around the world around this world um, so um, again an old hobby horse of mine is the role of chief analytical officer um, or chief analyst um, and interesting you know it was a job that Lorraine used to do when she was at NHS England and we haven't had a chief analyst since Lorraine since Lorraine left so um, I think there's a need there's a need for it at a more regional local level interestingly I think it would be something which would sit quite comfortably within an STP and somebody then who provides not only um, not only um, a lightning rod for for the community but some some you can say well if you were career-minded aspirational if you wanted a route to the you know so I want to be a chief analyst what do I need to do who do I you, you've got role models then that people can aspire to become and that's something we don't really have at the moment as well so I think that that's that's a bit of an issue so I'd like hopefully I, there's a recognition that we could do we could we could get that agenda going a bit more as well um, I think the other thing which I found certainly through some of the work that AFRA have been doing and you know kind of events like this is um, it's easier to connect virtually now. I don't need to take two days out of the office to, to come and hear clever people speak about stuff or to hear inspirational talks from folk. I can sit in my office and, and do that. And so um, hopefully that takes away some of the resistance from, from managers around, well, I can't release you for X or Y and I'm not willing to pay for rail fare down to wherever and hotel accommodation well perhaps those days have gone now perhaps we don't need that anymore perhaps this becomes the vehicle for for doing that and and people are there's there's a much broader availability of of folk around doing this sort of thing you know we'll set up youtube channels to do all sorts of things around stuff now we'll have online things we know for example i have, have a virtual kind of meeting on on a Wednesday we have a coffee drop in and people just you know as it says you drop in have a chat with folk about whatever I mean, it doesn't have to be about work you can talk about anything but I think that I hope that sticks I really hope that sticks so I think that's a that's one of the tangible benefits um, but again um, it needs people who are in positions of authority to accept that the world has changed now and Zoom is not going to kill the NHS. Uh, open source software is not the monster that people think it is. And there needs to be a loosening of the corsets around all of that stuff, I, I think, as well. And obviously, I mean, there, you know, there are caveats attached to that in terms of security and all the rest of it. But when I'm seeing people having to do Zoom, Zoom chats, you know, on personal mobile phones because the NHS won't allow them to put it on the machine I just, my heart sinks a little bit so I think that there are some good things that have come out of this that I hope do stick I still think there are some massive challenges around around the leadership agenda and the recognition that we need more than CIOs and CCIOs to, to move this agenda forward they've got enough of an agenda themselves without us lumping analytics into what the, they need to deliver um, and with the greatest uh, respect to all of them who are in those roles they don't really understand what our world is anyway so um so to expect them to deliver it is is a bit of a stretch paul that's great i mean you were touching on some of the practical benefits of virtual meetings like this i i just like to touch on some of the aesthetic benefits as well you didn't you wouldn't get a backdrop with lovely guitars lined up if we were sat in some conference room would you so it's been nice to see that too yeah thank you yeah but pretty bits of wood that that sit on a wall that i play badly but there oh, you go i suspect they're a bit more than that um listen i've really enjoyed talking to you paul that's been that's been fantastic uh thank you ever so much for your time and thank you very much for your thoughts you're welcome you're welcome